I've had a question from Sarah who said you talked about denial. Yes. Um, is that common, she says, in PTSD? Yes, it is. Um, the best example of this is a 90-year-old man who came from New Zealand to talk to me about his experiences with the Japanese. Um, and he turned up with a, a middle-aged lady who I subsequently discovered was his granddaughter. And after our very brief conversation, uh, he left without even sitting down having a cup of tea. It was quite bizarre. And she turned around and said to me, I just realised why we came back to the old country. She said, I thought he'd come back to see it one last time. He, he was British, but he'd been in New Zealand most of his life. She said, no, he came back to see you. She said, because we've never heard anything like this. It's the first time he's mm. ever spoken about it. Now, was he in denial for most of his life? The, I suppose it's important to de define what denial means. Uh, in my case, I think the first real experience of this was in the six-week period after the Falklands, we got back, we had a six-week period of leave. You naturally do the rounds, and telling my wife what had happened was very, very hard. Uh, and then I went from Scotland down to Devon to tell my parents, or to see them, of course. And the, their reaction was exactly the same. There was a sort of stunned silence. They didn't mm. know what to say. And then my mum said, well, OK, let's go down to the pub. So we walked down to the pub, and it was something I didn't want, um, because, you know, the country went mad back then. There was bunting everywhere. Yes. Everybody thought you were heroes and this sort of stuff. And I sat down at the table and a man came up to me with a pint and, and gave it to me, shook my hand and all that. He sat down and he just looked me straight in the face and said, so tell me, what's it like to kill somebody? And if that was to happen today, something as incentive to that, I can't guarantee my reactions would be what they were then. They might be more violent, but back then I just got up and walked out. It was almost as if there was a shutter in my brain. There was no physical re or mental reaction. There was just a natural sort of, I'm going away and that left it. And it's hard to believe that people can ask such a stupid question of anyone, regardless of their military experience, isn't it? When you see a lot of humanity in life if you live long enough and you yeah. live a proper life, you know, yeah. you meet all sorts, and that was just one of those things. But the denial thing to, to, to explain that, um, I, I think that lasted, in my case, well, probably all those 14 years I was still serving until it became patently obvious something isn't right and I've got to do something about it. Hmm. But I was also ashamed of it, I was, I was frightened. Do you ever remember that Jack Nicholson film, One Flew of the Cuckoo's yes. Nest? Yeah. A great film, but I, I remember when it came out being quite disturbed by it, long before I ever heard of the Royal Marines. Uh, and that was always at the back of my mind, you know. Things are happening in my head which I can't explain. And is this the beginning of being sectioned, for example, you know, and all that kind of stuff, losing your control? Um, no. I was frightened of all that stuff, so I never spoke about it to the doctors or any authorities. This is before you joined the Royal Marines? No, sorry. Uh, I'm just talking that film had an impact. No, that was, it, right. it was always in my memory. Right. Um, and that was one of the things that prevented me from asking for help. Yeah, OK. Um, the only help I did have was when I was training the officers in 90. So we're talking nearly 10 years after the war when I went to my officer commanding and said, look, I think I'm having a bit of a problem. I'm starting to feel a bit rebellious. And his advice was just go and see the doc. And I didn't, of course. Yeah. So, I mean, that was it. Um, so I think the denial lasted for quite a long time. 